Take your Bible and open to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. We're looking at a verse, making a little progress from last week. We're looking at a new verse. 19. Ephesians 2 19 says, Now therefore, we are no more strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. This morning I shared for the first time in many years the illustration that I've always wanted to use. I can't remember using it before. It's a well-known one of a boy who attended a church some distance from his home in a big city. And like we had difficult weather in the last month, he had difficult weather, but he always insisted on going to his own church. And when he arrived, almost always, there was this elderly gentleman who Sunday after Sunday observed his arrival like this, and uh, he asked the young man, the young boy, he said, with all the churches in your own neighborhood, this bad weather, why don't you go to one of those churches? Why don't you go to one of those churches? And the boy said, Mister, this is my church. This is my church. And as I've heard that story, I've appreciated the happy truth for this boy that he has a passion and a care for a local assembly of people who love Jesus. And he's rather stubborn about it. And I appreciate that kind of stubbornness. Loyalty to one's own gathering of the Today we are often like a buffet. We hear what's happening or being served at one church, so we go there. We hear something else happening in the evenings at another church, so we go there for the evening. And I, I came across this a dozen years ago at least, and I've shared it with many people. An expert said a dozen years ago that more, most believers will eventually have four home churches. Actual schedule of what is going on in each church will determine on where he will go. And unfortunately, that's the case in many people's lives today. I appreciate your faithfulness, often when there's not even a reason to be faithful, but your faithfulness and stubbornness as regards Woodside Baptist. We are a church with lots of failings. Come, come visit our business meeting this afternoon. Amen. We have many wonderful things about us. I'm thinking a little bit of getting up in years and maybe retiring at some point or being retired and thinking, what's going to happen with me and folks at Woodside Baptist Church? Because I'm going to miss so many people here. Well, that's what happens when you do care about somebody. And I thank you for your care for me and for the privilege of knowing so many of you folks so happily over 24 years has been wonderful to me. And I hope it goes for that. Our verse, you think, ah, what does this have to do with what pastor is beginning with today? Well, the verse, I think, really has the other bulletin. In the bulletin, a few notes that might be helpful. But uh, I think this verse has to do with fellowship. It has to do with the change in fellowship. Ah, it has to do with whether we need each other. I think we need each other. I think God has planned only that we have relationship with each other. I think He first of all wants our revived relationship with Him. And then He wants us to have a happy, healthy relationship with others in Christ. Look at verse 19, Ephesians 2. Now. Now when you see the word now, it usually is an indicator that something has changed from prior consideration, things have changed. There are identifiable things that have happened that justify this word now. All right, let's we'll put about seven books back here in the pulpit. There we go. Let's see what these are. The Illustrated Bible Dictionary, Word of Life. Jerry Falwell. Old Testament commentary. Carl and his offering envelopes. And a piece of paper that looks so interesting. Uh, what could this be? This is not a setup, by the way. Now, uh, come and join those who gathered around the manger, gazing on this 
those trays in your <laughs> Uh, I think we can track that down to over here. Just over here. <laughs> no, okay. uh, all right, we're going to get these to the church library eventually. <laughs> Let's see here. Right in the seat line. Yeah, I've already got that back. So, <clears throat> I think fellowship, we've forgotten about fellowship, the need we have one for another. And in these verses here this morning, I, I see in verse 19 some things that many of us are going through. Are you single? Pastor Rose was single until he was 30 years of age. At 30 years of age, I met and fairly soon after married a Diane. Diane doesn't like my preaching, so she goes out and works <laughs> out No, I can't say that. I think I will talk. But um, I, I know what it means to be single. I, I have a great sympathy, really, for single people. I think also of uh, single mothers. I was raised by a single mom. And I know that's very difficult, what a challenge to be a single mom. And I have a great sympathy for single moms and, again, for single people. What about being a Christian and being single? And what, there are many verses in the Scripture that have to do with fellowship, our need for each other. Perhaps the Bible needs to be saying that marriage is a help in some of the areas of our being and our living. Our verse again says, now therefore, we are no more strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. When I look at these words, I get a little bit of a familiar with the spirit. I see family, I see relationships. I see a lot of what I see in this church here. I'm so happy that the Lord led me here. In 1986, I was about to graduate from seminary. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with my life. I had from seminary a burden for city work. My seminary was near Philadelphia. So I figured maybe I'd end up in the city of Philadelphia. But I heard about a possibility here at Woodside. I came, my wife came, my children came, three successive, well maybe there was a little Sunday miss, but we had three Sundays and preached our heart out. I was telling somebody my very first sermon here was on Boaz from the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. And we came three Sundays and we were voted on and I graduated in May and we came here in July, July 13th, 1986. Probably the most important thing of my life, really, in many ways, other than trusting the Lord, my coming here. For I love these years and love getting to know you. I think of some of you just so dearly, and I'm amazed and overwhelmed. I don't know if you know this young family, the Gusses here from Manhattan. Now, I miss these guys for three or four weeks or more, and they live in Manhattan. And you come, you drive, don't you? You drive, so he's got big money, he can afford parking in Manhattan, you know that? No, I can't believe and understand, but you know what, it's so wonderful to have you here, Mr. Listeners. And I miss you when you're not here. And uh, praise God. Think of others of us in this room. I think of Anne Marie back here, just going around the room casually, uh, single for many years herself. Marries happily and has a wonderful son and a happy life. Praise God. I think of Edwin, Sarfati back here, preaching and listening to my preaching all these years, his brothers, his mom. And uh, so many years we go back, Edwin, and how happy I was as uh, you two married, Rebecca and Edwin, this summer. Uh, this is what Christian fellowship is sort of about. New people, old people, precious ones. All together, everybody different. Everybody different. You know, we've been looking at verses that show how Paul had more than a little burden of concern about those who were not like him. For instance, he was Jewish, and a lot of what we've been preaching on lately has to do with Gentiles and Jews. Gentiles. He has a care for the Gentiles in the church and their right positioning with Christ because he has a love for others in the church. We need to love others in the church, whether we always agree with each other or not, amen? We 
beginning to love each other when, when only half of us are superior good looking types and the others are playing like Pastor Rose. You know, you know that sometimes we don't dress well, sometimes we are not the greatest representations of the Lord, I suppose, but you know, together we're better than alone. We're so much better together than we are alone in Him. And I think of what these years have meant for me for precious souls, precious, precious souls, and their care for Jesus, our mutual care for Jesus. Now, Paul says here, for those of you who are Gentiles, things have changed. And earlier he says, by the cross, they have changed. Whereas before you were strangers and sojourners, unsettled almost, certainly spiritually. But now all that has changed, he says, at verse 19. But you are now fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Amen. I think about fellowship. I think about singleness. I think about marriage. This great city of New York, and I love New York City very much. This great city of New York is full of single people. Let's just say that we're 8 billion strong, counting the five boroughs. Many more people, if you call the outlying areas. 8 million people. Think of how many of those are single. Think of children who, in all their lives, short lives, have been single. They have not married. Think of elderly types that have perhaps marriage in the past, but they're either widows or widowers. Think of those in the bulk of us in the middle years between youth and the advanced age, and, and we have enjoyed either singleness or, some, in some cases, happy marriedhood for some years. We know what the race is like. We know what is going on. And so many of us have done it being a single person. You know, the Bible say, seems to say that Paul was unmarried as we know him in the New Testament. I've never really thought finally, though, that he was not married at some point in his life. I have a hard time not believing that he was married. Virtually everybody among the Jews was married. Singleness was a very great rarity. Although I think of the relationship between Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, brother, brother and sisters their relationship with Jesus. Were any of these three married? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? It's not clear. Marriage was something that happened in a young person's life relatively early compared to ourselves today. Did you hear that somebody, was it from Nebraska, won Miss America last night? Was it Miss America? 17 years of age. Whoa. Did you know that Mary probably was several years younger than that when she was pregnant with the Savior. <coughs> Joseph wasn't an old man. He was youngish compared to most of us in this room. I think marriage, I think age, I think singleness. People just did not have the social backups outside of family that we have today. And marriage was supremely important when people married early. Relatively few single people, period, in the Bible. Jesus, of course, was single. Never married. Our Savior knows what it means to be single. Our Savior knows it's not easy to be single. Whether he had particular trouble handling singleness, we don't know. But we know that he was single. We know that he never had the blessing, the privilege of being married. Was he unattractive? Was he uninterested? Was he asexual in that way? We don't know. How much of a desire sexually was there in our Savior? We don't know. But we know that there was always, almost always it seemed, a care for fellowship, for communion, for sharing. What about marriage? What about marriage? And what about singleness today? Why, today we have so many people who have been married, but are married no longer. So many people having children out of wedlock. So many people who are not getting married but are living together with people of the opposite sex. We have all sorts of abominations truly in the eyes of our God, and yet we still want the blessing of God. Isn't that what we want? We want the blessing of God, but we have so many exceptions when it comes to doing His will. What tragedies result. Today we are struggling through singleness and many of our married lives, sadly. And Christians are included in this too. What about marriage 
marriages, being married a lot is a lot on fulfillment and joy. If I'm married, am I guaranteed fulfillment? Am I guaranteed joy? And the answer to that is no. You and I are guaranteed joy as we have a relationship with our God. I want to stress that old line of words, Jesus, others, yourself. Joy. Jesus, others, yourself. You and I were not made to be married. We were made to love God. Adam was not made to be married. He was married to improve his health and his life. And he had a wonderful life with his God, but his privacy, the prime thing was his relationship with God. And so should our prime thing be, our relationship with God. If you're one of those who worships another human being, beware. If you're one who worships the state of marriage, beware. Worship the king. Worship the true one master. Worship God. But certainly being married is not a guarantee a lot on happiness, fulfillment, and joy. Joy comes by again loving and serving Christ with all your heart. Others next than yourself. That order to his glory. So marriage is not the answer for everybody. May I say though, it is the answer for many. When I look at the Bible, I see a presumption almost, with some exception in some content areas, there seems to be uh, a call for marriage. Marriage is important to God, may I say that? Your marriage is important to God. 